Thomas is a tank engine who lives at a big station on the island of Sodor. He's a cheeky little engine with six small wheels, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy boiler, and a short stumpy dome. So, you might have heard of this little blue train in his adventures. Thomas and his friends on the island of Sodor have captured the hearts of both the young and old alike for many, many years. Those young people included me as well. As a child who grew up with DVDs of the classic series and its dark ages, which, uh, yeah, weren't great. Blue Engine was Thomas. His firebox was on. Thomas resonated with me ever since I was a little kid. From the entertaining characters, to the gorgeous visuals, to the excellent morals, this series back in my day was at the top of the world in the late 2000s to early 2010s within the merchandising scene. Thomas Mania was everywhere in the toy department until, uh, well, Mattel took over and ruined the merchandise, but that's a discussion for another day, I swear. Back then, regardless of how the show was, Thomas the Tank Engine was number one to many children. The Island of Sodor inevitably became the biggest fictional railway to dominate TVD and toy sales everywhere. Except, uh, there was another. Far, far away from Sodor, there was some other railway in the late 2000s that dominated toy shelves and proved to be a big rival to the little blue tank engine. And that railway's name was... So, just like Thomas, Chuggington was another show I used to like as a kid. I didn't like it as much as the famous Blue Train, but I watched it religiously in my youth. Almost as much as Thomas. I found it purely because Disney Junior was an airing Thomas, so this was the next best thing. And hey, it paid off. I surely didn't have the merch, and it wasn't my favorite show, but I remember liking it as a kid. Obviously, I grew up finding cartoons such as a regular show and Gravity Falls and then moved on with my life. And years go by, I never gave that show a second look. Or at least until people started bringing up Chuggington when talking about Thomas becoming more, uh, for lack of a better term, surreal and cartoony. Whatever it is, you'll be sorted at your last. But what can't we do? What can't we do? Because of Thomas' recent downfall, I've started to see many people within Thomas' fanbase despise Chuggington. They hate it for being the unrealistic train show with the bouncing trains, which I, I sorta understand. But some even go as far as calling the show a rip-off of Thomas just for having talking trains. Ruined it! They really turned Thomas the Take Engine into that freaking bootleg rip-off Thomas the Take Engine Chuggington! This is honestly one of the worst things that ever happened in humanity. And since I'm over here whining about this children show... Take my words with a grain of salt, however, because I swear, there were a string of comments in 2017 that were dunking and hating on Chuggington in the comments of their own YouTube videos. I vividly remember the incident, but that has been locked out because of COPPA, so, uh, oops. In recent years, however, Chuggington did get a small cult following from th some Thomas fans, such as Califan, Rudely D, and the Milan Toon channel. These people have made either tons of in-depth content about the show, or put the show's characters in their own series. Suddenly, to some people, this show was actually underrated. Or was it? That's the thing I want to find out today. Is Chuggington truly an underrated diamond in the rough? Or is it another kid's show that's a Thomas ripoff? Not to mention the most important question. Is it in general? A good show? Let's find out. So ride the rails with me as we journey through this bizarre yet fun show's history, characters, writing, and world. To give some added context, while Chungington actually isn't a shallow bootleg of Thomas, it was intended to rival the little blue train, and you'll see why in a bit. Chuggington was the brainchild of Dick Rotkoff, former CEO of Learning Curve, a company involved with Thomas Toys back in the 2000s. Following the sale of Learning Curve in 2003, Dick sought to create an updated modern equivalent to Thomas because of, and I quote, 
While we were developing the toys, I had my problems with Thomas as a license. Yes, the Thomas characters were, were too mean, and it's terribly gender biased. The values that are there are very old fashioned and very little of what's taught as modern teamwork. But the license owner was smarter than I was. We have a brand here everybody loves, and just because the men are mean to women and there are very few opportunities for people to speak up, it's very authoritarian. There's nothing we're going to do about it because we're very successful as it stands. Rotkoff's complaints actually and kinda made sense, such as how Thomas had little to few prominent female characters or how sometimes the characters acted like mean-spirited idiots. The latter actually managed to be a concern when Hit Entertainment bought the show during those seasons, the same time when Shuggington was in production. At the same time, however, the bickering in the earlier seasons made Thomas stand out from other kids' shows by having the main characters in disagreement sometimes. Coupled with the priorities skewing towards pumping out product every year at the Thomas Hit Entertainment era, I can feel a cynicism towards Thomas and the need to make a rival that might be as successful as it. Partnering with Rob Loss, former CEO of Hit Entertainment, another company affiliated with Thomas the Tank Engine, the two founded Glodorum and began to push their brand new show into development. The series itself was spearheaded by Sarah Ball, the head writer of the classic Bob the Builder series. Funded entirely by a learning curve, Chuggington itself was picked up by the BBC for its CBeebies channel in 2008, with it later getting a US release on Disney Junior. Much like other British children's programming such as Thomas and Friends or Bob the Builder, the US dub would replace all of their UK actors with American ones. As season 3 entered production, several investors left the series as merchandise, while successful, didn't reach the level hoped for until 2011. The lower funds resulted in the third season going from 26 episodes down to 14. Executive meddling struck to make the series appeal to an older audience of kids, resulting in season 4's change in aesthetic, writing, and overall style. Unfortunately, the relaunch flopped hard, and season 5 would have to be reduced to only 10 episodes. After Chuggington's sudden cancellation in 2015, little content would be released due to insufficient funding and investment. Beginning in 2016, another relaunch would take place. This resulted in the short form Little Trainees shorts, which were recuts of episodes re edited into a shorter format. In December 2018, Ladorum was purchased by Hershey and the Family Entertainment, a company responsible for amusement parks such as Dollywood and Silver Dollar City. They would soon relaunch Chuggington in 2020 with one revival season and several shorts. This season would see decent success on Disney Junior, leading to the creation of yet another season that's still in the works as of this video. And Shogington wouldn't be the last 2000s cartoon to get a revival season, huh? Please finish in Ferb 2024. Please be good. As of right now, this is where Shogington's story ends the show. But that doesn't mean there isn't much to cover within this video. We still have a train load of content to sit through. And what better way to start than with the trains? Oh, I'm sorry. The Chuggers themselves. After watching a ton of episodes from each season in preparation for this video, I see that Chuggington is an episodic children's cartoon about a fictional futuristic city run completely by its railway. No cars, no planes, just sentient trains. The city itself is run by this robotic megaphone system named V, and she bosses around all the Chuggers in the city. A majority of the show follows three Chugger trainees as they learn lessons from the trainers and other side characters. The trio includes Wilson, the naive and clumsy American freighter, Brewster, the strong and hard-working diesel electric engine, and Coco, the fast and energetic Japanese bullet train. All three would be taught early on by the big jawed freight train Dunbar and the first responder rescue chugger Kali. For the majority of season 1, they would have either the trainees solve the job of the day or some random shenanigans occur, all the while delivering a good moral for the kiddies. Because of the aforementioned executive meddling, presumably to make the show appeal to boys who were into rescue vehicles, construction machines, and race cars, the trio would move on to advanced training from season 4 and onward. Each member would be mentored by a specific leader. Wilson gets mentored by Jackman, a rescue chugger leading Chug Patrol, a self-explanatory rescue team. Brewster gets mentored by Zack, a freighter leading the Chuggineers, a construction and engineering crew. 
and Coco gets mentored by Hanzo, the wise sensei Shinkansen leading the Speed Fleet, an express and delivery service at Chuggington. These three characters aren't bad, even by a long shot. They aren't in depth, as expected of an episodic children's cartoon, but they aren't unlikable traits who always get what they want. Unlike certain children's shows, in the earlier seasons, I found Wilson and Coco's voices kind of annoying. Uh, I'm still kind of sleepy. Well, I'm ready to roll. But Brewster in the earlier seasons didn't sound that bad. Right tunnel. We can have the quarry's up the mountain, not down it. Thankfully, as the show moved on, their voices got better on the ears, even with the recast in season six. Surprises? Did somebody say surprises? I love surprises, especially when they're a surprise. Wait! Except for Brewster, who managed to sound a lot worse. Ooh, I like the sound of that. The trainees, while having decent and distinct personalities, aren't the highlight of the show for me. Really, because despite being the main characters, they don't hold a candle to the ensemble cast of side characters that populate the show. These include the various citizens of the city, human or machine. Characters like, say, Harrison, Chatsworth, Frostini, Eddie and Hodge. Hoot and Toot, Rosa, Dunbar, Kali, Hanzo, Cormac, Speedy, Emery, or Old Puffer Pete. All of these characters are stronger than the main trio for varying reasons, in part due to either their unique gimmicks or their neat personalities. I have three favorite characters in the series, all side characters. My third favorite is Eddie, the human mechanic. Yeah, but I'm gonna fix it. Forget oil can, Eddie. I'm gonna be rock star, Eddie. Whee! But you are going to do other jobs today, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, Hodge. Good. Back soon. Eddie takes care of the aforementioned galloping goose Hodge as if he were his child, and I love their father-son dynamic within the show. Any episode with the two of them is bound to be a good one, or at least in my opinion. Their wholesome chemistry makes me wish for a spin-off about these two goobers. Plus, I like his charisma and charm so much so that I'm shocked he didn't become a Tumblr sexy man during the show's prime. My second favorite has to be Rosa, the crane-armed chugganeer. Arms? It, pardon, what does that mean? It's a uh, kind of my catchphrase. Oh, everything seems so different here. She is a Skylar recolor from season 6, and despite being a repaint, she manages to be more memorable than the character she is a recolor of. She's a very knowledgeable yet shy character, and to me, it's a good example of a diversity coded character, with her coming from a faraway country based around South America. Chuggington has a lot of diversity coded characters, but the diversity angle isn't their defining trait. Rosa is unironically superior to Thomas and Friend's own POC character, Nia, in that Rosa has a personality beyond where she comes from, and that her nationality isn't her whole personality. My absolute favorite is Harrison. Greetings, Harrison. Morning, Hanzo. What time will you be testing me? 4 p.m. shop. I'll be ready. You're good to go, Hanzo. Thank you. See you later, Harrison. So what do you have to do for your tour guide test? Take Hanzo and some passengers on a tour of my favorite places in Chuggington. So this classy and pompous diesel train. He's such a chad. He has a smug persona that on paper is unlikable, but he steals the show in any scene he's in, regardless of whether or not he's the main character. He reminds you of Gordon from Thomas in terms of personality. Both are big blue father figures with uptight personas. On a side note, I found out that his voice actor, Colin McFarlane, voiced Beresford in Thomas B. Journey Beyond Sodor. Go figure. It's easy to see that the characters are extremely diverse, so you could theoretically make a billion different episode combinations about them. And speaking of which... Writing-wise, uh, Chuggington's a pretty simple cartoon in terms of storytelling, being episodic with some continuity, but don't come in expecting anything groundbreaking or deep. If you're a newcomer to this show, just set your expectations reasonably low, please. Please. Remember what I said about the trio not being interesting? That is half true, or at least for the first season and maybe season 4. I'd argue that a chunk of the first season is very repetitive whenever the trainees are in focus, though it's understandable as the show is trying to find its footing back then. Most of the trainee episodes in season 1 are kind of formulaic. Trainees set up on a job to a specific colored tunnel by V, 
They do something dumb that ruins the mission or makes a mistake, but then they apologize and learn the lesson of the day. Simple as. Keep in mind that this repetitiveness only happens to half of season 1. The repetitiveness of this season isn't that bad compared to, say, early CGI Miller era Thomas episodes, where each formulaic episode has the same, same lazy structure. At least season 1 Chuggington has variation in its episodes, unlike Miller era Thomas, which has the same lazy structure, but they don't change up the formula. On the island of Sodor, all the engines are proud to work for the Fat Controllers Railway. On the island of Sodor, the engines like to puff and huff their hardest. On the island of Sodor, all the engines are- Like, shut up narrator! Chuggington, at the very least, is not lazy, with standout episodes in the first season being ones that don't focus on the trio or have a large ensemble cast. Some episodes that focus on the trainee seem to abandon that formula early on, such as an episode where Wilson helps out a sick Dunbar with his faulty voice box, or an episode where the engines race throughout the city, while Coco learns not, not to be boastful. Those episodes told a good moral and were entertaining while sacrificing the destination of the day type formula. Which makes me wish more episodes were like this in season 1. Thankfully though, this colored tunnel formula was permanently phased out for good. Any trainee episode from here on out follows unique story structures and morals, especially during seasons 2, 3, 5, and 6. Episodes from here on are way more creative in terms of concept or presentation, whether or not it has a trainees in focus, or sometimes they focus on side characters too. Season 4 on the other hand is kind of like Paw Patrol in terms of pace and tone. The trainees have to do their tasks of the day, whether it be a rescue, a building project, a passenger delivery, etc, etc, etc. It has one of the trainees in each and every episode with a little wiggle room for side characters. The gadgets they introduced are cool, but it felt like an overall disappointment in comparison to the previous seasons. They lack morals in favor of more fast-paced action. It felt like experimenting with ideas that while cool on paper, they lack the balance of decent storytelling and poeticness that made the series good in the first three seasons. Season 5 thankfully had a good balance of the original and new format of Chuggington, but the other half were thankfully side characters. It felt like a good blend of seasons 1 and 4, with more time for morals while delivering action and side character adventures. It felt like a true return to form. Season 6, however, abandons the trainee formula altogether and focuses more on Chugger's life and such. Whether it be an episode of, uh, Frostini's Midlife Crisis, Wilson's Bloated Ego, Hodge Fighting Aliens, or Ty and Cormac's Rivalry. These episodes are true return to form for the series, again, while still updating it for a new generation of kids. While the trainees are more prominent this season, the episodes they star in are distinct from each other and are memorably written. In fact, the morals have become way more subtle for a kid's show. The best example of this is the episode of Brewster's Greatest Gift in which the titular character has the dilemma of giving a spare radiator to a broken Hodge, who cannot do any more work now that his radiator is busted. The example is my favorite episode in the entire show because of how surprisingly heartfelt it is along with its great message. The message being that we have to give up something we have to help the life of another. It's a good allegory for organ donation and knowing if it's worth donating or not. In general, the writing of a majority of each episode is kinda good. They're entertaining enough for both kids and parents, or so I think. I'm, I'm, I'm just 17, guys. <laughs> Hold on. With the exception of Season 4, these episodes have a good moral for the audience at the end. Some more obvious than others. But the morals are great for both audiences nonetheless. For a Ladorum era example, the Season 5 episode Cormac Patrol has the titular character learning to find the right time to do something because he hates doing absolutely nothing. It's a great moral for kids, and even myself, that it's okay to do nothing all day because eventually, you'll find the right time to do something. As suggested, any episode with supporting characters and lead roles tend to stick. Episodes such as Training Time Harrison, Stop the Press Emery, Late Again Eddie, Cormac Patrol, The Three Ways of the Track, or Frostini's Meltdown. All depict side characters in situations unique to them and them only, such as Frostini having to deal with a power outage at the factory and now he needs Speedy to help. Or an episode about Ty learning meditation in peace from Hanzo the bullet train. Y you know, this sort of instance where the side characters are more interesting than the main leads is something I also find in Thomas the Tank Engine. Thomas himself is a fine protagonist, but everyone else, from Gordon to Diesel to Duck to James, steal the show completely. 
There are genuinely more fun and fleshed out characters than the character the show is named after. Same goes for Chuggington and its side characters. If the show had been a more ensemble based show, with each episode about the misadventures of one citizen per story, maybe it would have carved out a better reputation among the Thomas fan base. The writers have created such a unique world for these characters to live in, and in fact, The world of Chuggington is surprisingly unique for talking vehicle media. Rather than setting the series in the past, like Thomas or Tugs, or in the present, like Cars or Underground Ernie, Chuggington is set in a far future, in a clean, shiny, retro-futuristic, art deco-inspired city. Unlike Thomas, which is set in a grounded reality, Chuggington's reality is much more vibrant and whimsical in comparison. And I say retro-futuristic specifically in regards to the shiny and colorful metal buildings completely rounded out and smoothed out architecture. This show's aesthetic reminds me of both Blue Sky's 2005 movie, Robots, and Disney's 2007 movie, Meet the Robinsons. Both those two in Chuggington share a similar glossy metal sheen with their imaginative buildings and high-tech gadgetry. All three are packed with so much creativity. Even Chuggington's OST encapsulates that vibe relying heavily on mechanical noises coupled with playful tunes that help it stand out from Thomas. Here, take a listen. That's it, nice and smooth. Another thing of note is that the world building is surprisingly decent. For one, we have rules on how this universe works. There are no trucks or cars or planes, so the trains have to be the ones carrying loads around. Whether it be carrying commuters, transporting cargo, delivering mail, giving tours, lifting containers, or serving ice cream, the truckers can do it all. The truckers themselves are completely sentient, autonomous robotic trains, as implied by their animatronic eyes, hinged mouths, and malfunctioning voice boxes, or at least in a few episodes at least. That stroke of genius is the only thing Chuggington does better than any of the other talking vehicle properties, keeping the characters completely mechanical, unlike Thomas with their fleshy gray faces and the Pixar cars with their implied organs. Like seriously, why does Lightning McQueen have a tongue? As sentient robot trains, the truckers are capable of using gadgets through supposed electronics baked into their coupling system, such as mechanical rolling stock like cranes and magnets, all without a human operator. Speaking of the coupling system, the truckers can use their couplings like robotic arms to grab levers and push buttons to control giant machinery. The trains operating parts of the world themselves, with machinery such as, well, drilling tunnels or lifting shipping containers, make the show stand out from others in its genre. It's genius and makes us think of these characters as sentient vehicles instead of machines driven by people. The car series is the only thing that comes close to it, with the characters being completely self-driven too. But unlike cars, Chuggington still has humans present around these sentient machines. Given that some people might complain, some bring up the big question as to why there are humans in the show if the trains are completely sentient. Well... Humans exist to take care of the chugger's maintenance and repair, such as Morgan, Eddie, and Lori. They also manage certain businesses that the trains can't, such as Howie for the fueling yard or Cap and Charlie for the cargo ship. In terms of lore, the city of Chuggington was founded on an old steampunk town filled with steam locomotives before moving onto a bustling city full of diesel and electric trains during their invention, leaving the old town to be abandoned, or at least that's what's implied. I don't think we even know what happened to the old steam engines since they're only for an entire show that exists. We do know that Chuggington isn't the only city present, as there are Tudington, San Lokomota, and Zhengchu. All three have been mentioned at some point in the series, and it gives the implication that the writers want to expand the universe but are restricted by the show's budget. Given the creativity with the world building and lore, it must have been fun working on this show, coming up with unique train designs and creative machines while all on the standard television budget. Speaking of the budget, Let's address the giant elephant-sized chugger in the room, the animation's quality.
Let's keep this short and sweet, y'all, since few people have complained about it. In my opinion, the animation is fine. It's pretty decent. It hasn't aged the best, but for 2000's cartoon quality, it's solid as a rock and perfectly aligned. CGI seemed to take off during the early to late 2000s to varying degrees of quality, but in comparison to other 2000s era CGI cartoons, Shungitin's animation ain't half bad either. In comparison to another CGI train show, Underground Ernie, Shungitin's animation and characters have aged greatly in comparison. The humans and engines don't look ugly, and the characters are very expressive. However, it doesn't hold a candle to the early CGI Thomas episode's animation. While they stink writing-wise, they have slightly better animation and lighting and rendering, especially as CGI Thomas improved with the Brenner era. Speaking of CGI Thomas, outdoor sets like Thomas aren't interesting enough. Whenever we are in the vicinity of Chungington's outskirts, the environment looks pretty bland. It's just dead space with railroad tracks, trees, and a few mountains here and there. Then again, it must have been easier to render an open field than a gigantic city with skyscrapers and railways. A big positive with the animation, as mentioned earlier, is that the characters are very expressive. I know that's a big criticism some have with the animation, but I didn't mind the trainees jumping a lot. It's natural for some kids to be pretty hyperactive, and the detail not many notice is that the adult characters don't jump as often as the trainees, showing their maturity. Even 10-year-old me couldn't stay put. On the plus side, however, the animation progressively gets better with each season, especially with season 6. Regardless of the season's writing quality, the animation quality helps sell the shiny plastic future vibe with the characters and setting. The locations most of the time are filled out, and the city looks pretty stellar with the CGI bringing the aforementioned sheen out of the metal buildings. I can argue that it makes locations easier to translate into toys, and speaking of toys, Chuggington had a train-tastic amount of marketing and merchandising during its glory days. They had an interactive range where chuggers could talk to one another and interact. They had a wooden railway play rail and mega blocks range, not unlike their Thomas equivalents. And most importantly of all, they even had a unique diecast range later called Stack Track, with a unique coupling and track system along with a bunch of gimmicky playsets. Not to mention that the diecast line won a Guinness World Record in 2013 for tallest train set. Given that Learning Curve ran the toy line and eventually Tomy, both companies responsible for Thomas and Friends toys, they share tons in common with those made for the Little Blue Train. For example, Diecast was like Take Along, and Interactive was like My First Thomas. Not to mention the two shows have a wooden railway and Tomy Play Rail toy line, both backwards compatible with each other. Eventually, these toys would get phased out for Jazz Wars toys during the 2016 Little Trainees era to save on budget costs. You know, the company responsible for Fortnite, Halo, and Roblox merchandise, and uh... They look terrible, and knowing Jazzwares, they could have done a better job. Thankfully, after the Hershen buyout, Alpha Group started to make a new and improved toy line with a series of motorized diecast chuggers, pop and transform chuggers, and look alive chuggers. Sadly, it seems that Alpha has abandoned the line after some restructuring over in China, leaving them to drop all of their international toy lines. And it's a shame too, because there were going to be a re-release of the original stack track diecast and mini chuggers, not unlike the Thomas minis. Outside the toy line, the marketing for the show has been insane. There was crazy apparel, a live show, a theme park attraction, PSAs with both Amtrak and Union Pacific, and not to mention a surprisingly good Japanese dub with an exclusive credits theme song. The highlight of the show's marketing to me is that there's a game show exclusive to Japan called Makagington. How crazy is that? It's easy to see that the show had rock solid success. Not to the same level of success as Thomas, but let's agree that was more profitable than the, the Bob the Builder reboot or Mindy Express. More on the latter. Speaking of Thomas and merchandise, the similarities between the two's merch rollouts might have been why pe some people would think Chuggington was a Thomas ripoff. It's understandable, kinda, but you've gotta realize that the series was intended to compete with Thomas, not to rip it off. Let's discuss this gaff right now, I'm tired of this.
So, now we have come to the biggest thesis statement of this video. Is Chogington a ripoff of Thomas the Tank Engine? Well, my answer to that first question is a resounding... No. Not at all. Not really. <laughs> There are similarities that I want to discuss very quickly. For example, some people complain that Wilson, Brewster, and Coco are quote-unquote knockoffs of J Thomas, James, and Percy just for being a trio and sharing the same colors. Which is something I kinda do, but as a whole, don't get. They do share the same color palettes, red, green, and blue, but that's about it. They share nothing in common with their personalities and characterizations, let alone their genders and designs. If anything, Thomas, James, and Percy are, are not even seen as a trio often, compared with the trainees, who kind of fit the role of Thomas' naive personality and being the main character. Even if the three fit his role, their execution is way different, and that's all that matters. The execution. For example, V is undeniably in the role of Sir Topham Hat, but V is different in the way that she isn't a human but rather an omniscient robotic PA system. She shares more in common with Captain Star from Tugs, if anything. Both being megaphone-only characters who give commands dispatched to their vehicles. Even so, the execution is still different because V has a unique persona and voice. Not to mention, she is, well, a robot instead of a human behind the wall. Shogington isn't a ripoff, despite being about talking trains. It shares the same talking train concept with Thomas, yes, but its world building, tone, and writing, and characters are so vastly different and unique that it's hard to say that's a bootleg or a ripoff. Chunkington just takes an idea that exists and puts its own spin on things. Go figure. It would be like saying Disney's The Owl House is a knockoff of their previous show, Gravity Falls. Yeah, they both share a plot of the main character getting swept away to an unusual location being taken care of by a scummy old mentor with a mystery-driven plot. But both are so vastly different in their content and execution and context that they can easily be seen as two original things. Remember this, Thomas is, mostly, a laid-back kids show about realistic but sentient trains on a classic British-inspired island set in the past. Chuggington, meanwhile, is a peppy kids show about completely sentient trains in a technologically advanced city set in the future. It's that different, which leads to my next complaint people have with this show. It's too unrealistic and bouncy compared to Thomas. I keep seeing people bring that up a lot, and it just stings. After all, Chuggington shouldn't be judged by the tone of another show. While Chuggington is an undeniably weaker show compared to Thomas, people should stop judging more cartoony shows in comparison to more serious ones. Going back to the Gravity Falls comparisons, it would be like comparing Phineas and Ferb to that show. One is trying to be repetitive, quirky, and cartoony, while another is more grounded, dark, and mature. Things shouldn't be compared to each other just because they're totally different, even if the two are good. I think the series shouldn't be compared to one another just because one is better than the other. It's like the whole elemental versus across the spider verse discourse happening right now. Both are solid movies on their own, but it's evident they're going for two completely different styles. So it's pointless to compare the two even if one is superior to the other. But Thomas fan 726 I hear you complaining, but the show might not be good even if you don't compare it to Thomas. Oh well. I say, Baller Dash! I think that Chuggington is unironically a perfectly decent kids show. Not the best children's show compared to Thomas or even as recent as Bluey, but it's a good children's show nonetheless. In fact, I think it's several leagues above modern mind-numbing childish garbage such as Peppa Pig, Coco Melon, or Teen Titans Go. For all its faults, Chuggington isn't lazy or pandering to the lowest common denominator possible. If you want a bouncy and cartoony train show without any regard for its child audience with both sheer corporateness and cynicism, go watch Mighty Express. It's the exact kind of cartoon Thomas fans think Chuggington is. The characters are all annoying and bland, yet worst of all, the writing is pure laziness from reusing the same episode concepts over and over and over again. <laughs> Unlike Mighty Express, there was genuine care and passion put into Chuggington by its writers, despite its, uh, cynical origins. They built this vast world and memorable characters in the show that, while repetitive and annoying early on, didn't lose sight of what it wanted to be, unlike Thomas. It continued to evolve despite its struggles such as season 4's executive meddling, 
leading to season 6 being genuinely good for its approach to writing, not to mention being a good example of how to revive a long dead cartoon from the ashes. Let's face it Thomas fans, the reason why the cartoony nature of stuff like the Thomas Big World Big Adventure seasons or the Origins Go reboot don't work is that Thomas' uniqueness comes from it being a realistic take on such a goofy concept, talking trains being put into a realistic setting. It worked and gained the following because of the realism, as stated in this production image. It's intentionally the core appeal of Thomas for crying out loud. The core of Thomas is that the trains are treated as realistically as possible. They don't jump around, fly, dance, gesture, squash and stretch, or sniff flowers. The trains are big heavy machines that have weight to them. But when you rip that core out and replace it with Chuggington's physics, that uniqueness is suddenly gone. Thomas is suddenly just another cartoon, not unlike Looney Tunes or Tom and Jerry. Chuggington, while cartoony like other cartoons, had an appeal that made it unique in the endless sea of animation regarding talking vehicles. While it took good stories and morals, its characters and world are unique in their charm and design. The problem was that many people didn't see it that way because one or two talking vehicle franchises were financially successful and superior. Do I think Chuggington is better than Thomas, the tank engine, or even Tugs, or even Pixar's cars? Of course not, those three are infinitely superior. But then again, Chungintin's kinda good. Like, really, really kinda good. Don't get me wrong, the show has some problems. <coughs> Season 4. But when it's good, it's pretty good. It is overall a slightly flawed yet a pretty good cartoon for kids. And that's fine. And if it's good enough for me, then it's undoubtedly a good show for kids. This show is more in line with something like Underground Ernie or Bob the Builder. The talking vehicle shows that while worse than Thomas, they both have a charm to them that makes all three stand out from the famous blue train. All the while, telling good stories with fun characters and great morals. Overall, I felt like this video was something I needed to get off my chest in regards to the larger Thomas fandom. Whether you like Chuggington or not, I hope this video made you see a new side of things. Until season 7 comes out, I wouldn't watch this show again after this video caused me stress, but I feel it was worth this video's existence. Due to my nostalgia for both trains shows, it was essential for me to make this video. I hope you enjoyed this video or Chuggington, and if this video validates your opinion, that's amazing! Well, just like the trainees, I think it's time for us to get chugging home. This has been Whack. Like, comment, and subscribe. And most importantly of all, stay wacky! Chug